session. And the first speaker today is uh, Claire Monteleoni, who is uh, at Columbia here in the digital science uh, computing learning systems uh, uh, department. And she's going to talk about climate science. Okay. Thanks. So, right, I'm at a research center here in the School of Engineering at Columbia um, that focuses on machine learning. Um, and we couple tightly with the computer science department. Um, so just because I might be the first machine learning speaker of the day, I want to get on the same page about what, where I'm coming from with my research. So it's really motivated by the explosion in the amount of data sources that are being generated from many, many sources. Of course, everyone in this room has their pet data source, um, but there's many data sources. Certainly any time you do anything on the internet, a trail of data is created, and this is only increasing with social networks, et cetera. Um, biological applications have been uh, creating plenty of data, as some people alluded to this morning, and we all know that environmental applications are also creating large amounts of data, such as satellite imagery. Um, so machine learning is tasked with finding patterns in data, but these real data sources have attributes that actually are challenging or potentially problematic and for which we need to um, adjust our machine learning algorithm design. So not only is there quite a bit of it, it can be extremely high dimensional, as we've heard. Sometimes it's noisy or raw. By that we mean um, it could be partially distorted or missing in places. Um, it can be sparse, meaning that even though you record data at a very high resolution, for example, many pixels in an image, really the information of relevance lives in a much lower dimensional subspace. Um, some data actually arrives in a stream over time or is actually time varying. Um, and some data is actually sensitive or private, such as uh, individuals' medical records or financial records, which are increasingly getting analyzed. Um, so <coughs> I'm, I'm going to try to get on the same page with what I mean by machine learning. It's actually an umbrella term for many algorithm, algorithms and techniques coming out of computer science departments, statistics departments, um, even some in applied math and um, finance. Some of these techniques are also considered data mining. Um, but standard batch machine learning, before we complicate it with any of those complications of real world data, um, this is the batch, meaning that you get a batch of points ahead of time, supervised learning setting, meaning supervised means that they're all labeled. Um, you are given a set of labeled points, and you want to find a good classification rule that describes your previous data well and generalizes well to future unseen uh, data. So for example, if you were trying to fit linear classifiers, you might fit this one. Um, and this is very general. I usually motivate it with a medical application, so I'll just say that now. You could imagine saying, these are medical records of patients. Each point is a medical record where we've taken, say, 10 tests on a patient, such as hemoglobin level or other points, let's assume they have real valued output. So these are points in 10 dimensional Euclidean space. And then this linear um, classifier that we fit is our current classification rule for the disease. So, so and, and say the labels uh, positive and negative are the diagnoses with respect to a particular disease. So if a new patient comes in and say the results of their 10 medical tests put them over here, um, we use our, our current disease classifier learned on past patient data records to, to predict something about the probability that the patient has the disease. In this case, we think it might have a red diagnosis for that disease. Um, so that's just to get on the same page by what we mean by standard batch supervised learning. And then um, generally, I'm interested in studying the complications that arise in real data sources. Um, but I still want to provide algorithms that are quite practical in terms of their use in practice and for which you can actually prove formal performance properties. Um, and personally, um, in my career, I've mostly focused on the following problems. Maybe you don't re receive a batch of data, but you receive data over time, learning from data streams, and I'm going to motivate that a bit more. Um, I've also worked on learning from data that might not be labeled with respect to any particular classification task. Most data originates raw, and for that I've worked on a model called active learning and also on algorithms for clustering. Um, I've also worked on privacy preserving machine learning, how to output classifiers learned from private data that don't violate the privacy of the data, the, say the medical records on which they were learned. Um, 
And then, of course, I have this new application area that I'm really excited about of um, using machine learning to speed up discovery in climate science. I'm mostly going to talk about this, but um, the algorithms that I'm going to apply in this particular um, project that I've worked on are from the field of learning from data streams. So let me just uh, quickly spend some time motivating that. So a lot of data actually arrives in a streaming fashion, such as, for example, stock prices. You might want to make buy-sell decisions on stocks um, based on making real-time predictions of their prices. And the, the data arrives in a streaming fashion. Sometimes uh, the labels for data only arrives in a streaming or online fashion. So if the machine learning algorithm is your spam filter, which is trying to learn your pre uh, preferences between spam and not spam, it's only going to receive labels on messages, junk or not junk, when you as the human happen to label a few messages. So it has to update its, its classifier in an online or streaming fashion. Um, these, also, these methods also have wide use in settings where the data itself might not be streaming. There's just a, a large fixed amount of it, but you might want to process it um, in a, as if it were a stream simply because you have limited computation power. You are a sensor. Um, or a mobile robot or a handheld device, for example. Um, so in the streaming model, we can think of it as um, a stream of data moving past sort of the data access mechanism. You can think of this as sort of say the reading head of a Turing machine, but say that only moves in one direction. You can either imagine the data moving past the head or the head moving in one direction. And so what I mean by that is that the data access mechanism is one at a time. So once a data point has been observed, in the stream, you might not ever observe it again. And sometimes um, you also care about uh, being able to make real-time predictions. And this models some of the forecasting problems that I motivated. Um, so one thing you could do is take the existing literature on batch machine learning and simply wait around collecting data points in the stream until you have a large batch of them and uh, run standard machine learning on them. Um, but really, we want the form of the solution to match the problem, and so we often care about resource constraints on the learning algorithm. This will be a little bit less applicable in the climate application, but this is a motivation for why we care about lightweight algorithms in, uh, for learning from data streams. So in particular, any computation that your procedure does upon each new observation, the running time of that shouldn't grow with the number of uh, observations since the beginning of time, and similarly, the memory usage. Um, so not only would this model resource constraints on, say, a small sensor that really has uh, very limited memory, um, but in general, we're designing algorithms. Algorithms are going to be run on computers, which by virtue of that are resource limited. Yes? Uh, are you doing parameter discovery also? So in a sense, are, uh, is the algorithm able to discover a new dimension, which, which would help with classification or the number of parameters or types are given at the beginning? So this is um, an entire field. Um, this was many of the algorithms in my PhD thesis fell under these two constraints. <coughs> so this is very high level. There might be such an algorithm with, within the entire field of learning from data streams that does that. But I'm about to talk about a specific algorithm, and then I might be able to answer your question better. Or maybe that would be a better time to discuss that question. Sure. OK. But thank you. Um, OK. and so. So in contrast to the model I put on the screen before, you get labeled da data points one at a time, and you can adjust your classifier, but you, um, but you can't store all the data since the beginning of time. And this sort of characterizes a lot of uh, what I've worked on, and I'm going to talk specifically about supervised learning from infinite data streams in this application to tracking climate models in climate informatics. But I'm also, I mean, in case anyone gets interested in machine learning and wants to speak offline separately, I'm interested in the interface between learning from data streams and learning from raw, unlabeled data. So I've worked on uh, learning from data streams in the active learning and clustering models. Um, so climate informatics is this new application area that I'm really excited about because there are many pressing or potentially open um, controversial questions in climate science um, that have the potential to really impact society. Um, and we know that machine learning can really revolutionize some of the other areas to which it's been applied. So here I, I have examples of some of the natural sciences, um, such as bi biology, which has really been um, 
a lot of um, new discoveries have come out of bioinformatics, which is a marriage of data mining and machine learning with biology. But also, I mean, a, a, a claimed success of machine learning is web search, right? So half the people in my field, if they don't go into academia, are at Google, Yahoo, and Microsoft. Um, so we know it works, or at least we know it works. We think it works. Um, and we would like to <laughs> extend the benefit to climate science. Um, but it's actually a two-way street. So our initial, um, our initial collaborations have shown that um, it, it can help accelerate discovery, but it also, this collaboration reveals new interesting machine learning problems um, that suggest new interesting questions for algorithm design. Um, so here are some of the related collaborations that I know of that have been burgeoning up, and if there are uh, more collaborations I should add to my list or you know my related work section, you know please uh, uh, get, uh, let me know offline. I don't mean to offend anyone that has a related work um, not on here, but this is I'm just trying to piece, uh, piece this together because I'm also doing community forming around climate informatics. I'm organizing the first workshop on climate informatics, and that'll be in New York this summer. So I want to plug for that, and if people want to stay involved, come to me afterwards. Um, but I know of people that have worked um, on data mining and atmospheric chemistry, some earthquake prediction. This was an El Nino event prediction problem where um, I believe he is at the <coughs> Earth Institute, and one of his collaborators, Tony Jabara, is in the computer science department. He's a machine learning professor. Um, what I've worked on so far personally in terms of my own collaborations is in the field of climate modeling, one area of climate science. Of climate science. Um, and the related works I know with respect to climate modeling, um, there's a group of computer scientists at IBM Research actually who without actually collaborating with sci uh, climate scientists have introduced data-driven climate models and so far they're not using them predictively but they're using them for climate change attribution. So if you have a bunch of atmospheric gases, you know which one was contributing most to rising temperatures. Um, using uh, Granger causality group elastic nets, where, which are essentially some technology coming out of um, Bayes nets, probabilistic uh, graphical models. Um, and then I also know of various hybrid techniques where uh, people have been looking under the hood of a climate mo uh, model and trying to enhance it with neural nets or other techniques. Um, I'm personally working on looking at the predictions of the whole uh, multi-model ensemble of GCMs, global climate models, and trying to track their predictions. So this slide, I guess, is less needed for this audience than when I give the talk in computer science, but in case there are astronomers that need a refresher, what is a climate model? So first off, it's not a data-driven model. So when we talk when we use the word modeling and machine learning, we're usually talking about models that are fit from data. These are actually mathematical models fit from, uh, that are actually based on first principles. So differential equations where the reaction rates aren't uh, too controversial to model a bunch of different components in the atmosphere, clouds forming, sea ice melting, advection, um, and also how these couple are mathematically modeled. So you have a large system of interacting mathematical models for each of these components um, that are supposed to model the entire sort of atmosphere ocean system, which is now discretized um, into grid boxes. And different climate models handle this discretization differently. Um, so you could have maybe a 100 kilometer cubed box, or maybe the vertical could be based on level sets of pressure. Um, these decisions have made, been made differently by different climate modeling groups. Um, and they actually have to address some interesting challenges, and the biggest one that I see is scale interactions. Um, because, you know, clouds are very important for climate, but to model clouds, you have to be looking at a very um, small geographical level to uh, really model raindrops condensing around atmospheric um, particles. Meanwhile, the ocean is enormous and circulates, you know, on the order of hundreds of years. So how you couple these is... Um, a real problem of differences in scale that is sometimes handled by discretizations or parameterizations. Um, but this is just to motivate why different climate models might differ. Um, here is some of, here are some of the climate models that um, contribute to informing the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So each of these is a laboratory that's been around for around 30 years and had many scientists contributing to it. And each climate model is run as a really large software simulation of these mathematical models. So I believe the first climate model was at Princeton in 1969, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, and then 
many of these, you know, there's a couple in Japan, Max Planck in Germany has one. We have one at NASA here, actually in this building, um, at GISS. Um, but each of them is a lab with a long history where different meteorologists and scientists have contributed. Um, and they have, they all contributed to, or at least uh, 20 of them or so, contributed uh, to a report um, for which they were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. And their next report on climate change is gonna be due in the next few years. So the hope is that any collaborations that we can do to um, help improve climate predictions may actually be impactful in this report. Um, so when we consider the outputs of these GCMs, these global climate models, on any particular variable, and I'll describe what variable I'm plotting in, in a minute, we actually see that there, are, um, there can be large variances in the predictions among models. So these really thin curves are um, predictions of a particular variable from uh, 20 GCMs. Red is um, their average prediction. Actually, we saw this from the statistician this morning, um, similar plots. And blue is the observable. Um, so the, what I am plotting here is global mean temperature anomaly. So a temperature anomaly is, um, okay, so this is why they might differ from each other. A temperature anomaly is a difference between the raw temperature at a fixed location, say today, and um, the temperature at the same location at a fixed benchmark time in the past. And the reason why anomalies are studied instead of raw temperatures is that they have less variance over location when you go to average them. So for example, today, <coughs> it's 20 degrees colder here than in San Diego, um, but if we look at the difference in temperature between um, today and some fixed, uh, and the same calendar, calendar day in 1960, um, the difference um, between today's temperature and that in New York might be only one degree, and similarly, the difference between today's temperature in San Diego and that same date in 1960 might be two degrees. So now when you average, um, there's lower variance. And I'm making a slight simplification. So the anomaly benchmark is not a particular date in the past. It's usually a, a time frame, like the average temperature between 1950 and 1980, but in the same location. So now um, we average these temperature anomalies to get a global mean over many, many locations across the globe. And to get a global annual mean, we average, um, those temperatures um, over many locations and many times per year. So there's one number per the globe per year output by each of the climate models, and then we're comparing it to the <coughs> observable, uh, the blue of that temperature. So, um, and the variances go up as you zoom down and only take your mean over a particular area. So here's um, a lat long box corresponding to Africa, um, Europe, and the Middle East, uh, uh, North America. And I don't know why I said that. <laughs> but, um, and this is from 1900 to 2009. Um, we can also look into the future. We don't have observable data past, say, 2009, but we have model predictions into, 20, uh, into 2098. And what we see is even if the mean did a relatively um, good job of matching the obs um, obser uh, observed mean temperature anomalies, um, we don't have temperatures in the future, but we can compare the mean to the model trajectories, and it starts to diverge from pretty much every one. There's a star-shaped configuration and um, significant fan out. Um, this is uh, monthly future data for Africa. Monthly, uh, it, it's, uh, we've already done uh, subtracted the monthly anomalies to um, correct for seasonality, but this is the monthly data into the future for the regions. So the goal of this work was coming out of the climate science community, there were various results saying that no one GCM is the best predictor over time of all variables. Um, and actually just taking the average over the, the GCM projections. Okay, sorry. I've been using the word prediction a lot. That's because I'm used to talking to computer scientists. But that should be corrected to projection for any climate scientists in the audience. I know that that's the proper term in your field. Um, but the average projection over all GCM projections was um, better at matching observations than any one fixed GCM's projection. So that had been noticed, and it was the subject of a meeting on how to combine the multi-model ensemble of GCM's, um, of IPCC G GCM's, and we actually got to present some preliminary work there. But we were concerned with what could we do that would perform better than the average. Um, and it's not a, a simple time series prediction problem like from finance where you can look at 
some signal in the past and try to predict how that signal will behave in the future, we'd like to take into account the model projections as well. Um, so we actually have some recent work on this. We won actually a best paper award from a NASA conference that, at the um, Ashok's conference, the, uh, the Conference on Intelligent Data Understanding. Um, by applying an online learning algorithm that actually I had presented in some older work um, in the machine learning community, um, which essentially treats the climate models as just a set of experts that you want to uh, track. Um, and so for, and so the, the um, variable that we were tracking was mean temperature anomaly. We did so at global and regional scales, annual and monthly scales. Um, for historical data, we could just run on past data, and this was valid because the models are not data driven. Um, although it appears there might be some knowledge of past data in the loop, and um, that, that's an aside when, when, when I conclude we can talk about that. Um, how would we run future simulations? Well, we don't have any temperature data in the future, but we, we still would like to run future simulations. So what was suggested by our climate science collaborators was the perfect model assumption. So you have your, your ensemble of, of 20 models. You clamp one, say the ith model, and say that that generated the observations. Now you only train on the remaining 19 as to how well the remaining 19 can, uh, can, um, can track the, the projection, the model projection that you chose to be the, um, the best fixed one. Of course you have to run this multiple times, right? It wouldn't make sense to just do that for one model. So we ran multiple simulations like that. Um, Okay, so because this is not a machine learning audience, I'm just going to spend some time to motivate online learning and then explain the algorithm. Yes? So you have some input parameters for the models. So uh, do you vary For the them? climate models? Yes. So uh, do you have a chance to change them to see how stable is the prediction as a function of the change in, in each parameter or something? So I believe that the multiple runs were just different random instantiations, and then we only used one run per model. But within a particular data set that has all IPCC models, the input conditions and all forcings are the same. Um, it's not ensembles as you're talking about, about just varying the parameter. But from the machine learning perspective, the algorithm that I'm about to present can definitely be used in that setting. Yeah, we haven't run those experiments, but it's completely flexible to that setting. Because yeah, then you can take into account the error and the, and the, and the change in predictions. Uh-huh. Right, so I'm about to describe a very general algorithm that you could also use in ensembles that just differ by parameters. Good. So this setting is learning from data streams, back to what I motivated before. The data streams are infinite and it's the supervised setting, so all the data is labeled. In this, in this um, problem for tracking climate models, it's a regression problem. So for each time, uh, each, uh, time point, you have a temperature uh, value. So generally in this framework, the algorithm would predict a label for the current data point before looking at it, just um, to improve its, its, um, its current classifier. You write down a prediction loss that makes sense for your problem. I'm keeping this very modular. In the climate models task, it's just the uh, squared difference between the predicted and observed uh, variable because they're just predicting um, these regression values. But this can also be used for classification, so for example, you know, in natural language processing or genetics. Um, and then the learner can update its hypothesis, and it, it would make sense for it to take into account what its prediction loss was. That's why it predicts a label before viewing the true label, so it can compute a loss between its prediction and the true. Um, as I mentioned, just through the prediction loss that you choose per problem, this is extremely modular. So you could apply it to a regression, classification, multi-class classification, um, different sorts of classifiers. They don't have to be linear. Right, any, any separation function. Um, we have no assumptions on the data. So we're not even assuming IID. We're not assuming that the data is independently identically distributed from a, a fixed distribution because we're not assuming any distribution. Um, in fact, all the performance guarantees hold, even if the, uh, there's some adversary that watches our every prediction out, um, action and, and engineers data to mess us up. So um, these are sort of worst case guarantees. Because we have no distributional assumptions, any performance guarantee is relative. So regret bounds um, bound 
the difference between the cumulative prediction loss, so the prediction loss summed over all the observations of the algorithm, and that of the best in hindsight um, algorithm in some comparator class um, when hindsight site takes into account the, the observation sequence. Um, so we're concerned with algorithms that have access to a set of experts. In this case, these are the climate models, the GCMs. And the algorithm is always going to make a prediction simply as a weighted average of the model predictions. But we're going to change these weights over time based on how each model is predicting. Um, so we'll initialize them to uniform, but I'm going to talk about a few different rules for updating this distribution over your experts. Um, so this is just a modular way to represent the loss function indexed by expert i's prediction at time t, um, and it also takes in the true um, observed value at time t. So one thing you can do is just standard Bayesian updating. Um, you can penalize experts for having high prediction loss um, using this exponential. And this has a long history, um, not just in our field, it actually goes back to electrical engineering, the lempel ziv sequential decoding algorithm. Um, it's not so great if you expect your data to change over time, right? Because if you start with um, a uniform distribution over your experts, you're going to quickly hone down and put quite a bit of weight of an expert that predicts well at first. But the other experts' weights will go down to zero exponentially fast. So if observations change, it will be very hard to grow back up weights on one of the experts that wasn't very good in the earlier iterations. So now I'm going to talk about the same kind of scheme. I'm still making predictions as a weighted average um, over experts, but I'm going to add some uh, modeling of the time varying nature into my update rule for the weights over experts. <coughs> and I'm going to do so using a hidden Markov model. So a hidden Markov model is a graphical model, meaning that nodes are random variables and edges are conditional probability distributions. This is more general, if you've seen HMMs before, this is more general in that we're allowing arbitrary dependencies between observations. This just makes it actually more general. Um, and this hidden Markov model, um, the identity of which expert is currently the best predictor is the hidden variable. Now, even though we're modeling that there's one fixed expert that's the best at any one time increment, we're not going to predict with that expert's prediction. We're still, as I said, going to predict with a weighted average over expert's predictions. But this is the model used to update those weights. And to, um, whatever your loss function is for your problem, which in this problem, again, is just the square difference between the predicted temperature anomaly and the observed temperature anomaly, if you just equate that with the negative log likelihood of the observation, given that expert I was currently the best in uh, past observations, then you yield this HMM um, whose Bayesian updates correspond to a, a family of online learning algorithms in the literature. So now when you do your Bayesian update, you have to condition over which, um, which expert was best at the past iteration um, of the same update, and you also have to specify transition dynamics. So what should this transition dynamics be? We could let it be the identity. So we're essentially saying if one model is good, it will always be good. And then we get back to that very simple Bayesian update I showed you before. But as I said, that will not generally model time varying data very well. So what you could do is take the identity and subtract from the diagonal a small fraction alpha. So the modeling assumption is, you know, if expert I was good at time t, then at time t plus one with high probability, expert I will still be the best. But with some small probability, alpha over the number of experts minus one, the best expert could switch to be any of the other experts. So this is just a diagonal matrix with one minus alpha on the diagonal and alpha over the n over n minus one off the diagonal. And it allows you to explicitly model the fact that the, the identity of the current expert might switch over time. And, and intuitively, this is a lot making sure that none of the expert weights are allowed to drop down to zero exponentially fast, because you're, you're always mixing in a little bit of the uniform, sharing some entropy over the rest of the experts, so that you'll be nimble in case your observations change. Um, you might be wondering how to set this parameter alpha. So that is going to essentially be you know, the level of time varying or non-stationarity in your sequence, how bursty things are, how often you expect to switch between experts. 
And what we showed is that you can't know this beforehand. So not only did we show that empirically, we, we also um, showed a negative result um, for, um, for not knowing the value of alpha beforehand. So the, the algorithm that we had proposed a while back was the following. I'll make a bunch of copies of the hidden Markov model, but each parameterized by a different value of alpha. So alpha is a parameter ranging between 0 and 1. I'll discretize it and feed different values into these different um, sub-algorithms. Each of those um, are algorithms of the original form, maintaining the weights over the experts, the climate models. But on top, we're tracking the best fixed value of the parameter using the standard uh, Bayesian updating that's trying to find the best fixed value of the parameter. So usually at this slide, someone asks me, why do you track the best fixed value of the parameter? You could track the best switching value of the parameter. And certainly you could increase this hierarchy to more and more levels, but you essentially have diminishing returns. So we can already prove something strong enough without that. And also we have a general rule in machine learning is that as you increase model complexity, you need, um, you, you suffer from overfitting if you have the same amount of data or said alternately, you need more data to get the same prediction accuracy. So this suffices. Um, and what we can show is that, so if you compare the hidden Markov model that used the best value of the parameter for the observed sequence, where best is with respect to minimizing the cumulative prediction loss, it's um, the regret for using some arbitrary value of the parameter um, is linear, and it can also be linear in the lower bound, although this, this is sequence dependent. But we avoid the lower bound entirely and um, have asymptotic savings and regret by using our algorithm that learns the parameter simultaneously. Um, and we also tell you how to discretize that parameter to be regret optimal, although you can discretize it uniformly and it still works well in practice. Um, so let me um, st state what the application is. I've essentially already said it. The experts are going to be the GCMs. Um, and in this case, we're, um, they're predicting uh, mean temperature anomaly. Um, so we have both global, regional, um, annual and monthly experiments. Um, the prediction loss is just the squared difference between the predicted temperature anomaly and the observed temperature anomaly. Um, and you can see our paper for how we discretize alpha. Um, so we, we got uh, model projection data from the CMIP3 archive, which is an archive of IPCC um, global climate model projections. Um, from and we used from 1900 to tw uh, 2098, 20 models in the ensemble. Um, to run the historical experiments, we got uh, global mean temperature anomaly data from GISTEMP. And as I said, for future simulations, we just had to use the perfect model assumption. So fix one model, pretend that it generated the observations, and train from the remaining 19, and do this multiple times. And then these are the latitude longitude regions corresponding to. Um, our experiments for Africa, Europe, and North America. And we drilled down on time scale with those and also ran some future simulations. Um, actually, let me first show a plot that I know Gavin likes this. So um, here's a qualitative uh, feeling for what's going on. This is a learning curve. Um, this is a future simulation, and um, this is blue is the identity of the worst of the remaining 19 models. Um, at predicting the, the model chosen to generate the labels. Here I zoom down on the y-axis. Red is the, the multi-model mean, the average over model predictions. Uh, green is the best out of the remaining 19 at predicting the, um, the model generating the labels, and black is the algorithm. Um, and then I'll show you some tab tabular results. So the, the thing to beat, this, the sort of thing used in practice was, as I said, just the average prediction. And so we're, we're doing well with respect to that. And a standard batch learning algorithm is also doing pretty well for the global annual experiment. Um, and one thing that we noticed was that there was actually a best climate model on the experiment that we ran. Um, but this went away as we zoomed down on particular regions or at monthly time scales. Also, um, the climate scientists that wrote about there not being one best climate model were talking about multiple variables, so maybe um, carbon dioxide concentrations or other things other than temperature, that you can't be best over all of that. Um, but as we drill down to regions and then from annual to monthly, 
the variance of the data increases. So regional data has more variance because it's not average over as many geographical regions. And monthly data, even when you account for seasonality, has more variance sim simply because um, the annual data is already averaged over each of those 12 months. Um, and so you start seeing the advantage of our approach um, with respect to the average prediction and also with respect to logis uh, linear regression, which suggests that because the data is time varying, you don't want to necessarily take a, a batch approach because a batch approach doesn't focus more on the present than the past. Um, and, oh, and yeah, here are some of the other curves that were summarized in those tables. Here are the curves um, on average versus, um, like the average model is red and the algorithm is black for the regions going into the future. Um, and yeah, here are the tables that summarize those. So actually sometimes the batch algorithm was okay on that. Um, and I guess I'll take a moment to discuss future work before we have a few questions. Um, so I've basically just been working on a macro level. I haven't been looking under the hood of a particular climate model, just been allowing the GCMs to give us predictions and we're working on how to combine them. And so there's more to be done there. I think that a lot of people would like to see us run on other benchmarks. I'm hypothesizing that carbon dioxide is one, but maybe there's some other climate benchmark that we should run on. And that wouldn't require us to change our algorithms at all. Um, one thing that we might want to change is add a spatial dynamics in addition to temporal. Because it might be that some GCMs are better at predicting some locations than others. Um, what has frustrated me about, um, about this work is that we always require observed data to update our, our weights of our models. So really, um, we would like semi-supervised or unsupervised methods for learning with experts, but this is an open problem for machine learning algorithm design. So that, that's an interesting open problem that has been spurred by our work. Um, and I actually had some initial results for unsupervised learning with experts, but it's for clustering, um, so it's not directly applicable. Um, also, there's no reason we can't just use batch techniques. We don't need real-time predictions. Um, so we would like to ex um, experiment with many different approaches in the literature. However, we've initially seen that an online method is doing better than a batch method, and as I said, that might just be because um, the online method puts more weight on the present, which for time varying data is important. You sort of want to forget the past. Um, and we might want to look into transductive regression, um, where you just need to predict temperature, say, at the year 2020, 2050, and 2100. You don't need to interpolate the entire curve with time. Um, so that should make the problem easier. Um, however, existing performance guarantees only exist when the unlabeled data distribution is the same as the data distribution, and in our case, they're not the same. In fact, the support is disjoint. Um, I'm also interested in my um, collaboration with GIS to really look inside a climate model and see if there's ways that we can help, and parameterization, especially to somehow integrate the cloud simulations, which are happening at much smaller um, geographical scales than even a single grid box um, have been proposed to us. Um, I'm also interested in some way that we can uh, form hybrid models between these physics-based models and data-driven models. And I think this might exist in some other fields, so if you know of it anywhere, this is not even a technical term, this, I just mean hybrid between physics and data, please come to me afterwards because I'm trying to figure out um, what literature exists. Um, and we've also been asked to look at how do you calibrate a climate model or compare climate models in a principled manner? Um, and just generally speaking, I think it's a sort of a two-way street where um, we can take reasonable assumptions that are used in practice and use those assumptions to give us theoretical traction for designing um, algorithms with provable performance guarantees. And then finally, I just want to plug the workshop. And it, it's, um, it's gonna be very interactive. So even if you're not sure if you want a collaboration in this field, you should come along because we're going to have sort of breakout sessions where um, we'll have challenge problems coming from the climate scientists and then a bunch of people can brainstorm about solutions and you might actually walk out the door with a collaboration. That would be my blue sky goal um, out of the workshop. Um, and I just want to thank various people I've worked on. Actually, this is a, th a thank you slide from another talk. The people on this paper are Gavin Schmidt, who sits a few floors up and runs the GIST model. 
um, and some students. Eva Asplund at Barner, who's getting um, a bachelor's in computer science at Columbia, and Shailesh Saroa, who got a master's in computer science at Columbia. And these are all people that have helped me on other stuff. Thanks. clear to me that the metric, I forget what the terminology you use is, but uh, it, the, the thing you really want to be aiming for is the square and the difference between the prediction and, and you know, what you're seeing. Is the model robust to different kinds of, of you know, desirables? I guess I don't oh, totally. Yeah, that's called the prediction loss, and it can be instantiated in pretty much any way. So we would love domain experts to come in and tell us, oh, try it with this way. And then we'll show you that we track, with respect to your loss, um, the models. But the loss can be anything. Yes. Yeah. Well, OK. Data. The loss can be anything for um, what you uh, use in practice. So for all the theoretical guarantees that I showed to hold, you just need to show, um, uh, you just need to prove a small property. Um, well, I can t talk to you offline. But yeah. if you want all the bounds to hold, so you take the pair of your prediction function. Mm -hmm and your loss, yep. and you prove um, essentially an upper bound with respect to um, using the log loss, so negative log likelihood as your loss function. And if you can get that to hold, and it doesn't have to hold tightly, it's just a bound, um, then all the theory goes through for free. And many classes of loss functions have been studied so far. But, um, but another interesting thing would be to take loss functions that make sense in climate science and try to prove that um, lemma as well. Um, yeah, so you could do that. You could have that one model 
You could have 10 models where five of them are just copies of one model running with different parameters, for example. Yeah? Well, next to the last slide, you had uh, something about a hybrid model. Yeah. Uh, is this, are you talking about data assimilation or something different? Well, um, I think that's one of the places that it's been showing up. Um, essentially, it was just a realization that we're not going to be able to talk to the climate scientists if we try to replace physics-based models with data-driven models. And, you know, I don't want to do that. <laughs> and physics-based models have a certain level of predictability just because of physical laws having some inertia and smoothness that should make the prediction problem easier than a lot of machine learning problems. So I'm now trying to search the literature, and one thing I've heard of is, right, the ensemble Kalman filter, the field of data assimil assimil uh, assimilation. And this could be widely applicable, for example, to say robotics, fluid dynamics, other fields. But first, I don't want to in reinvent the wheel, and I want to find out what's out there. But yeah, in the past week or so, I've been hearing data assimil assimilation, so I need to look into that. Okay, we have